the um, uh, natural resource coordinator for Region 4 of State Parks. Region 4 is basically Southeast Texas, so from Lake Somerville to Brazos Bend State Park, Galveston Island, Sea Rim, up to Mission Tejas, uh, near Nacogdoches. Those are my my parks. Uh, most part, most of the folks within the State Parks Division um, take care of the park visitors. They keep the grass mowed. They keep the restrooms clean. They take the money. Um, they break up wild alcohol fueled parties. Uh, but what I do is I try to uh, manage, maintain, restore the natural landscapes of our parks. And our goal is to uh, try to get a coffee for just a second, my friend. Yeah, can you do this? Oh. I was hoping. I was hoping that was for this. Thank you. There we go. All right. Um, is this just for the recording? Okay. So, uh, um, what we try to do with state parks is we're actually mimicking the national parks system. The national Park Service has a very good resource management program, and uh, with this is a lot of uh, research that they do, and one way in which we emulate them is uh, we try to manage our park landscapes for what we call pre-European settlement. So it's a landscape that definitely was partially shaped by man. Um, you know, we do understand that humans are part of the natural ecosystem here in North America, but uh, it's a time at which, um, you know, the Native Americans' technology, they didn't have bulldozers, right? Um, they didn't have, you know, everywhere, sheep, cows. So the landscape was in a sort of a state that had definitely been impacted by human beings, pretty much a, uh, I guess you'd call it an equilibrium state, and what most biologists would say would be healthy. And how do you measure the health of an ecosystem? Species diversity, biodiversity is a really good way of, of measuring and one thing that's been found by the National Park Service and other researchers and that we agree with is that if you try to manage for that pre-European pre settlement landscape, you're probably managing for a maximum amount of, of biodiversity across your landscape and the, the larger areas. So how do we do that? Um, one of the ways we do that is uh, a lot of our state parks, unlike National parks, they weren't set aside because there was an outstanding natural feature. Um, a lot of them became state parks because a wealthy legislator donated the park, donated, donated their ranch, or some uh, fairly well-off person donated a ranch that became a state park. Uh, in some cases, we did purchase the lands. Uh, here at Sheldon Lake State Park, this was a reservoir uh, originally constructed by the war industries, uh, by the Department of War in 1941 uh, to pro provide water for war industries along the Houston Ship Channel. And uh, in 1950, I believe, it became a wildlife management area. 1990, it became a state park. Prior to it being a state park, it was farmland. It had been, the prairie had been plowed up. Well, a lot, a lot of what you see just behind us, just behind this building here, was actually part of the reservoir. Half of the reservoir was drained and then it was farmed from 1950 until 2003. All this land was, was farmed for rice and other crops uh, to feed snow geese. Um, well, we got more snow geese we know what to do with. Uh, the season on snow geese, you can fill your pickup truck bed with snow geese because snow geese are eating themselves out of house and home up on the tundra. We don't have near the number of geese we have today, but if you go to Arkansas, you can see where all of Texas's geese now spend the winter. Uh, the actual North American population of snow geese is, is as high as it's ever been, much higher than prior to when people came on the scene and started growing rice and such. So uh, unfortunately, the, the prairie that was here, the land that was here, was all leveled off for rice farming for geese. Um, so you can see that originally, you know, this land was being managed for a single species, snow geese. And you can kind of see the trouble that single species management can get you into. So 
even the areas here that hadn't been inundated by the reservoir, and there's a lesson I'm getting to, um, had been plowed. The prairies that hadn't been inundated by the reservoir were plowed up to, to grow rice, and now uh, for snow geese, and we got more snow geese than we know what to do with. That's where single species management will take you. Um, that's why we're trying to manage, again, for the, the whole landscape for this pre-European uh, settlement. That's our goal. Um, how did the land look back then? How do we know what it looked like? Well, there's, there's dis good descriptions. There's actually botanical surveys. Um, there's descriptions by botanists. And on the coast of Texas and Louisiana, we've got this great resource, which are these 1930 aerial photos photos taken I think between 30 and 32 uh, by folks looking for things that would tell them where to drill for oil, salt domes and faults and, and such like that. So they actually photographed the whole Texas coast. Um, and we can use these, these photos that are indispensable in determining, oh yeah, this is what the land looked like prior to it all being leveled off for farming. So this part of the world here at Sheldon Lake Star State Park looked much different than it does today. Let me go into this. You can figure this <clears throat> about this. This is a neat photo. That's a cane break. So do you all know that we have native bamboo here in Texas? We do. We have a native species of bamboo that grows down in the river bottoms. It's called cane. If you look at a lot of the creek, creek names are Caney Creek. Caney Bayou, it's named after this stuff. It's mostly gone now. It's a, this is a whole ecosystem that's essentially been erased from the, from the face of the Texas coast. So, uh, and being erased with it are all the animals and plants that were dependent upon that, that ecosystem, many of which are probably never to be known. So, uh, this is kind of what we're doing, why we're doing it here at, at, at this park. And I really like uh, Reed Noss's quote. Reed Noss is going to be speaking at the North American Prairie Conference to be held at the University of Houston Clear Lake next June. Second through the 6th. Second through the 6th. Come and see him. He's great. You should sign up for that conference. Put it on your calendars. But he said poor training in natural history leads to second-rate conservation. What he's trying to get at there is a lot of the a lot of the training now that um, biologists get are, is basically at the cell level or uh, even smaller than that. You know, the money to do research is for researching cancer cures and uh, the whole idea of trying to learn birds and plants and things like that has gone out the window uh, in many cases. And he wrote this book recently kind of um, pushing on that point that we need to get students out there out into, the, out into nature and explain what's going on so that they can understand it. Because unless you understand it, you're not going to be able to, to, uh, to do a good quality restoration project. This is what Texas looks like uh, 1984. It's much worse now, but all the light brown you see is farm land. The light, light green you see in East Texas, that's all pine plantation, which not much different. Well, pine plantation, do you know how old those trees get before they cut them? No, more than 10, but 25 years is probably average. Yep. So it's not much of a forest. So you can see if you take away all that light tan color, take away all that light green color, even here in Texas, there's not much land that's even in its native plant. It doesn't even uh, contain its native plant community, let alone a high quality plant community. So. Uh, what we're doing here, even though these state parks are tiny relative in other, uh, even urban areas that are, people will say they're little postage stamps, they're little vignettes of ecosystems, um, they're important. They're important pieces. They're important um, reservoirs of biodiversity. And again, I wanted to point out one thing about prairies is they don't, originally it was thought, well, you have where it's real wet and rainy, you have trees. Where it's dry, you have grass. And that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot that goes into it. More importantly is having a soil that's amenable to grass growth and not so great for growing trees, which we have, that horrible clay soil. Uh, a flat area where if lightning hits in one county, there's really nothing to stop the fire from burning. Again, um, fires, wildfires were a natural part of the landscape here, and uh, trees don't like being burnt up. Grasses seem to love it. 
Uh, so where you have a lot of light, uh, you land. So if you look here at this map on the right, that's precipitation uh, for the United for the United States, lower continental uh, U.S. And you can see this, the wettest area is right here along the Gulf Coast. Well, all of that, uh, other than the Mississippi Valley, which is bald cypress and other bottomland hardwood forests, the rest of that is all grassland. So Florida, the coast of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, all that was uh, longleaf pine savanna, which is really a whole great big diversity of grasses and flowers and then a few species of trees. But because the trees are obvious, People tend to think of it as a forest, but really it's a grassland with some trees growing in it. And, and here you have this grassland growing where it's the wettest part of the, of the U.S. And again, the reason is because uh, it's very flat and it catches on fire a lot from lightning. So this is one piece of Sheldon Lake State Park that was not <coughs> uh, farmed. Nope. I'm sorry, this is the nearby Greens Bayou Mitigation Bank, which still has a little bit of this uh, uh, of pine savanna on it. Uh, you can see the light green trees are kind of invading that prairie. Uh, the pines were always there. Um, so when we talk about grasslands, it's not just a, a system that was open, open, nothing but grass. Trees are definitely a part of that. If you go to Brazos Bend State Park, you can get a really good idea of what uh, our grasslands look like clumps of trees surrounded by grass. It's more typical than just a sea of grass as far as you can see. Uh, uh, many of our grasslands are endangered because they're being encroached by forest. You have to have occasional fire. Uh, grazing also plays an important role. Uh, bison grazing, which is gone. Um, cattle grazing is a good substitute for that, but typically uh, stocking rates are uh, are, are higher than what they should be for grassland conservation. But uh, this is from Davis Hill State Park, which was uh, originally shortleaf pine savanna. Uh, the shortleaf pine was cut out, and it's not been burned, and the trees are taking over. But if you walk through the woods, you still see remnants of the grassland community. This is Indian plantain. Um, again, how do we know what the land used to look like? Aerial photos. Uh, reference sites like I just showed you, um, areas that hadn't been disturbed, um, books, uh, diaries. And again, this is the extent of the uh, tall grass prairie along the Texas-Louisiana coast. It was a huge area. Almost all this has been lost, uh, mostly to farming and overgrazing. This is a Houston area specifically. So the, the light yellow was forested, and you can see uh, the river valleys had trees growing in it. Much, much of the rest of the coast here was grassland. So when people tell you Houston was grown up on a swamp, it really was grown up on the prairie. And they're adamant here. They are. And <laughs> however, when it rained, that prairie probably looked like a swamp. I mean, it was full of water, not trees, though. <clears throat> So uh, we took it here at Sheldon. This is Sheldon Lake State Park. What you see in the lower photograph is that 1930 photo, and it's not easy to tell, but uh, what does that mean? Three minutes? <laughs> um, eh, blind myself. So in the, in, the end, in the bottom here, you see these little dark areas? That's water. So in the little white areas, those are called Mima Mounds or Pimple Mounds. So originally that... In 1930, you could see all the little marsh ponds that were on the prairie. And those ponds were actually wind excavated depressions and the material excavated out of them by the wind, blown out of them by the wind, piled up in the surrounding grassy prairie and mounded up as those little white dots. Those are little sand dunes uh, called Mima Mounds. And if you look for Harris County, at least, we have one foot topographic maps. And you could see all the little, all this little string of round circles, those are all marsh ponds. So you can see where the ponds used to be, where the dunes used to be, uh, where the low flat prairie was. And we can put all this together. We've even got, this is where we're at right now, is that open field in the foreground here is where this building is. We can even have pictures of what the prairie looked like prior to them uh, piling it all up for rice to grow for geese. 
And <clears throat> we've got reference areas like Brazos Bend State Park where you can see the darker green is the wet marsh, the light is the sandy upland Mima Mounds. We know what this used to look like. So that field that's being torn up right out there, that was a San Augustine turf grass farm. It was being farmed by a tenant farmer. Um, we're, we're taking that and we're going to restore it. The area at the south end of the park used to look just like that prior to restoration. So the idea is to not just restore the plants here at Sheldon, but also to re actually restore the contours of the landscape itself. There's some good reasons for doing that. It has to do with uh, uncovering buried marsh soils that, do that are great for growing marsh plants, uh, trying to get so some areas that are humped up higher that drain off so we can have dry prairie as well as wet prairie. Um, and again, this is from Brazos Bend State Park. It just gives you an idea what the prairie look like, what a prairie looks like when it's not being farmed. Dick Benoit Prairie Park. What I want to point out, see the trees in the background? Trees are definitely a part of this uh, original landscape. Here's an area that's being heavily grazed. And you can see these, these are the little sand dunes, the little Mima Mounds I was telling you about. And one of the neat things about them is they have this ring of alkaline soils around them that's incredibly alkaline, does not grow plants very well. It means it's, it's high in salts. And there are some native, I mean some uh, endangered plant species associated with those and some rare plant species. <clears throat> Glass lizard, lots of cool birds. And again, uh, we're trying to take all the elements of what we find in the undisturbed prairie and bring it back to this turf field out front here. So that's, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but let me show you one last picture that kind of explains what we're doing. This is the Nash, this is a LIDAR photo of the Nash, a LIDAR image of the Nash Prairie that was modified using computer program to generate an incredibly detailed topographic map. So you see that purple line, purple is lower, the green is higher. Our prairies weren't flat. All of this land is created by river deltas. And with river deltas, you get old river channel remnants, you get old sandy banks, sandbars, all that. That's what created the diversity of our landscape. With, with these ancient rivers, I'm talking, you know, 180,000 to 1.2 million year old river deltas. It's, the deltas are still forming along the Brazos, but this land here, it's been a long time since the river's been flowing on it. But it made this incredible landscape. You see how, look at all the ponds that used to die. Well, still do. This is a, a recent photo out there where it hasn't been plowed. You can see uh, how dominant these old channel scar features and all these windblown depressions were on the landscape. All that was erased. All that difference between having the little sandy, tall little sandy dunes, tall, a foot and a half, three foot, maybe five <laughs> foot tall at the most. Those nice little sandy dunes, you can imagine that sort of growing environment versus this wet, almost permanent clay uh, soil covered in marsh. It was an incredible landscape. It was incredible for uh, waterfowl and water birds. It was incredible for things that needed the grasslands, meadowlarks, prairie chickens. And it's the loss of this landscape for farming. Basically all, you're just taking a blade and scraping that all flat so that it could be uh, flood irrigated. That is why we've lost so much biodiversity, which is why we're trying to bring this uh, conserve this landscape where we can and restore it where we can. Thank you.